All right, great job, guys. It's good to be here and good to see all of you here and have the opportunity to just open the Word of God and, and, and hear what God has to say to us today from His Word. I think that today's sermon is a sermon that really ought to speak to all of us. We're studying verse by verse through the book of Acts, and today we come to chapter 18, and, and, and our text verses, our key verses are going to be the last part of verse 9 and the first part of verse number 10. Um, uh, Paul said... Actually, God said something profound to Paul here. Something that I think at one time or another in our lives, each one of us need to hear. This is what he said. He said, do not be afraid, for I am with you. Don't we all need to hear that from time to time? Don't be afraid. I am with you. And no one is going to attack and harm you. I know Paul needed to hear that because I've read the story. And we're going to talk about that story today. But before we do that, let's pray together. Father, I'm grateful to you for your love and your mercy and for Jesus. I thank you, Lord, that, that you're a God of encouragement. That you tell us we don't have to be afraid because you've got our back. That nothing can touch us without first passing through you and getting your sovereign approval. And so, Father, help us today to remember not to be afraid because you're with us. In Jesus' name and for his sake. And amen. Now in our, in our last lesson from the book of Acts, when we concluded that lesson, Paul had left um, the city of, or we had left Paul in the city of Corinth immediately after a significant turning point in his ministry. And we talked about important turning points in our lives and, and that turning point for him came when he said in verse number six, from now on, I'll go to the Gentiles. And this action, uh, this decision to change the primary target of his ministry from targeting the Jews to targeting the Gentiles um, demanded that he change the place of, of most of his teaching. He had been teaching in the synagogue. Now he, he would leave the synagogue and go next door to the home of a Gentile and begin teaching there. And then that's in verse number seven. Paul left the synagogue and he went next door to the house of Titius Justus, a worshiper of God. And, and as a result of this turning point in Paul's ministry, many Gentiles were saved and baptized. You see, when we make a God-inspired turning point, good things happen. Luke wrote about that in verse number eight. He wrote many of the Corinthians, and those would have been Gentile Corinthians who heard him preach at, at the house of this Gentile worshiper of God. Many of the Corinthians who heard Paul believed and were baptized. And isn't that the main thrust of what we're trying to accomplish in the world today? Get the word of God out to people so they can believe it. Their lives are changed. They get baptized. They go public for Jesus, and they begin to make an impact on the lives of other people. And in the middle of all of this, the leader of the Jewish synagogue was so influenced by Paul's preaching that he and his family became believers. Luke wrote about that in, in verse number eight. Crispus, the synagogue leader in his entire household, believed in the Lord. I'm sure that created quite a stir among the Jews because the Jews did not believe primarily that Jesus was the Messiah, but now the leader of their synagogue is convinced that Jesus is the Messiah. He believes in the Lord. And this entire sequence of events no doubt had a, had a negative impact on the Jewish community in Corinth. They did not like what was happening. They had already begun to oppose Paul and become abusive toward him. Luke wrote about that in verse number six. As he, as he wrote, they, they opposed Paul and they became abusive. And so when Paul abandoned the synagogue and began to minister primarily to the Jews and he influenced the synagogue leader to become a Christian, it would have only made the Jewish opposition and abusiveness worse toward him, which is implied in the next section of this chapter that we're going to talk about today. We're going to talk about encouragement from God when things got tough, when things looked the darkest. When Paul began to doubt himself and doubt his mission and doubt why he was there, then this God of encouragement stepped in. You see, God knew that the growing threat from the Jews in Corinth was beginning to discourage Paul. You ever been discouraged? Have you ever been there? Just kind of felt down and out, just kind of felt like things weren't going the way they ought to go. And so Paul was feeling that way. And so one night God appeared in a vision to him to encourage him. Luke wrote about it in verses 9 and 10 of this chapter. 
He wrote, One night the Lord spoke to Paul in a vision. Do not be afraid. Keep on speaking. Do not be silent, for I am with you, and no one is going to attack you and harm you because I have many people in the city. What a statement from God to Paul at a moment when he needed it most. The one of the things that I, that I am so captivated by with God is his precise timing. He always knows how to step in at just the right moments and pr- moment and provide exactly what we need. Evidently, the Jewish opposition to Paul had reached a point that he was becoming fearful and that he was about to discontinue his preaching ministry in the city. He was about to quit. And so God stepped in with these instructions. Do not be afraid. Keep on speaking. Do not be silent. You see, unless Paul was afraid and he was about to quit speaking and he was about to remain silent, then there would be no reason for God to give him that set of instructions. God knew his heart. God knew what was about to happen. And so God told him exactly what he needed to hear. And then God spoke to Paul those words that every Christian who is ever discouraged needs to hear from him. He said, I am with you, and no one is going to attack you and harm you. You you see, the second phrase in that verse clearly indicates that there were some Jews in Corinth who were planning to attack and harm Paul. Otherwise, there would have been no reason for God to say, no one is going to attack and harm you. People were evidently planning to do that. And and then Paul, because God was with him, would not be permitted to be attacked and to be harmed. God was going to encourage him. God was not going to let these evil men carry out their evil plan. And so what encouragement must it have been for Paul to hear God say, I am with you, so don't be afraid. God's got your back. God's in control. God is still on the throne. God can still protect you. He can provide everything that you need. And that bit of divine encouragement must have been exactly what Paul needed because he conquered his fear, he continued to speak, and he refused to remain silent. Luke said it in verse number 11 of Acts chapter 18. So Paul stayed in Corinth for a year and a half teaching them the Word of God. And aren't you glad he did that? Just for our example, to show us that when it feels like we ought to quit, that's not the time to quit. When we feel like we ought to quit, that's the time to turn our ear toward heaven and listen to what God has to say to us and get the encouragement we need from the God of all encouragement. And so there was divine protection. I'm especially blessed by the reassurance that God gave Paul after he promised his presence. He said, I'm with you. That was the promise of the presence of God, wasn't it? Do you realize that God has made that promise to every one of us? He's always with us, regardless of how dark, regardless of how bleak, regardless of how how hopeless the circumstances may look, God is with us. He promised that. He said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. He's always with us left us in those moments when we need him the most. And after promising his presence, then he said to Paul, no one is going to attack and harm you. And that was the promise of divine protection. This statement clearly indicates that as long as God's servant is on mission for him, he is under the protective custody of God. Nothing can touch him unless God permits it. Nothing can stop the mission until God says it is complete. Are you aware of that? Are you aware that as long as you're on mission for God, you have not only the presence, but the protection of God? As long as you're on mission for God, until the mission is complete, you are invincible. None of the powers of hell can stop you as long as you're on mission for Him. God promised that to His church. Jesus said, I will build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. The devil cannot win when God's on your side. So if you want to be on the winning team, if you want to live under the protection and in the presence of God, you need to be on mission for God doing what it is that God wants you to do. And then nothing can stop it. And you can rest in that. You don't have to be stressed. You don't have to be worried. You don't have to be anxious. You can be confident that God is going to do what he said he was going to do. You know, we've seen this right here, right here in our, in our own 
in our own ministry here at the Open Door Church. Um, first, we started, the, we started the food pantry in the clothes closet. Well, let's go even back before that. Before I even came here as your pastor, when you started the Open Door Church, um, all kinds of things were said. All kinds of murmurings around the community about this new church, and you were called a cult, and you were called all kinds of things, and there were complaints because you were meeting in the school, and so you moved to the community center, and finally you relocated here. But there was all kinds of opposition against what God wanted to do here but the devil wasn't able to stop it because God had your back God said I'm with you no one's gonna gonna attack you to harm you he couldn't stop what God had started here and then then we decided that we needed to be more outward focused and so we started the food pantry in the clothes closet and there was all kinds of criticism about that all kinds of people saying oh that's pointless and that's useless and giving stuff to people that don't really need it and people come and take advantage of it and they drive good cars and they got plenty of money and they don't need that and, but we kept on doing what we knew we needed to do because it's not about the food and it's not about the clothes and it's not about the people who come and maybe abuse the system. It's not about all of that. The, all of that is secondary. The reason we give away food and clothes is because it gives us the opportunity to give away the gospel. And we've been able to give away Jesus to almost 100 people now through that ministry because we were willing to move ahead with what God wanted to do and nothing was able to stop it. In fact, in the middle of a lot of that criticism, them, then God put it on a group of people to donate to us to the, the, the facility of the First Baptist Church here in Hawkham so we could move the clothes closet and food pantry over there and even expand what God was able to do. So you see, nothing can stop what God wants to do. And then we started talking about opening Freedom House. And oh my goodness, at this buzz that went around town when we started talking about that. And all the criticism and all the misunderstanding and all the bad information. And you know, people saying, oh, that'll never happen. That won't happen. The state won't let that happen. The county won't let that happen. The city won't let that happen. Guess what? It's happening. The staff is here. The directors are here. I mean, it's happening by, by sometime early next year, maybe late this year, depending on God's timing. It will happen. Why? God's got our back. As long as you're on mission for Him, doing what He wants you to do, nothing, nothing can stop that. And so it's such an encouragement to see that not only does it happen today, but it was happening centuries ago in the life of the great apostle when he was in the city of Corinth. And so God gives him this encouragement and this, this promise of divine protection, regardless of how desperately the Jewish community in Corinth wanted to harm Paul and stop his mission of evangelizing and discipling their city. God had decreed no one is going to attack and harm you and Paul could rest in that. And God kept his promise because Paul remained there, still preaching, still discipling, still evangelizing for another 18 months before another death threat surfaced. You say another death threat surfaced, exactly. God never said it would be easy. He never said there wouldn't be any problems. He never said there wouldn't be opposition or threats or suffering or anything like that. What he promised was that when those things come, I'll be with you in the midst of it and I'll offer my divine protection. Luke wrote this in Acts chapter 18, verse number 11. Paul stayed in Corinth for another year and a half teaching them the word of God. And I'm so glad we've got heroes like that whose stories are recorded in the Bible. Because it, it helps us to understand that in spite of intense opposition, you can do what God wants you to do. So he stayed there and continued the ministry that God had given him. And then when another round of opposition and abuse toward Paul arose, God simply kept his promise. The promise of his presence and the promise of his protection. Uh, read about it in verses 12 and 13. He said, when Gallio was the proconsul of Achaia, Achaia was the Roman province in which uh, Corinth was located. Gallio was like the governor of that province. When he was the proconsul of Achaia, the Jews of Corinth made a united attack on Paul. You see, it wasn't just a scattered little bit of pockets of resistance here and there. The Jewish community in that city made a united attack on Paul and brought him to the place of judgment. They drug him into the court system. This man, they charged, is persuading the people to worship God in ways contrary to the law. 
a serious charge in the Roman Empire, encouraging people to worship God in ways contrary to the law. God extended divine protection to Paul, even in this instance, by orchestrating the political events of the Roman Empire so that this man named Gallio had become the governor of Achaia in 52 AD, which was just prior to the Jews' attack on Paul. That happened in late 52 or early 53. And in 52, early in 52, this new governor had arrived. Gallio was, a, was noted in ancient Roman history as a man with a pleasant, gentle, controlled disposition, not a raging madman like Pilate had been who ordered the execution of Jesus. But this guy is, is pleasant, he's gentle, he's controlled in his thinking, and he possessed an acutely intelligent legal mind. Gallio listened to the charge levied against Paul by the Jews who said this man is persuading people to worship God in ways contrary to the law. The law referred to by the Jews was their Jewish religious law, not the law of Rome. You see, they wanted to make it a Jewish issue, an issue of their Jewish religious law. And Gallio recognized that. He immediately recognized this as a case that was not subject to the jurisdiction of the Roman court because the charges were not related to Roman law but to Jewish law. And therefore he quickly analyzed and dismissed the case. A man who was of less intelligence and not so astute legally might have been tricked into believing that the charge was against Paul for the violation of Roman law, but it wasn't. It was Jewish law and he recognized that. Luke wrote about it. Just as Paul was about to speak, Gallio said to them, If you Jews were making a complaint about some misdemeanor or some serious crime, some violation of Roman law, it would be reasonable for me to listen to you. But since it involves questions about words and names, and here it is, and your own law, your Jewish law that Rome cares nothing about, then settle the matter yourselves. I'll not be a judge of such things. And he drove them off. How incredible. God used the legal mind of a pagan Gentile to protect a man of God who was on mission for him. A less astute legal mind might have endangered Paul's life by proceeding with the case, but God arranged for the right judge to be in the right place at the right time to extend his divine protection to his servant. And so Gallio cleared the courtroom. He drove them all out of there. Luke wrote, he drove them off in verse 16. Now the Jews <laughs> must have been enraged by their failure to convince Gallio to try and potentially execute Paul. They would have been depending on the leader of their synagogue to successfully bring the charges and secure Paul's execution. They would have thought that was his job. Stand up for the constituency of your synagogue and rid the city of this religious menace who's preaching that this Jesus of Nazareth really is the Messiah. Do your job and get him executed. That would have been the desire of the Jews in the synagogue. And when the leader of the synagogue failed to get the job done satisfactorily, then the Jews vented their anger toward him. Notice what Luke wrote. In Acts 18, 17, then the crowd there turned on Sosthenes, the synagogue leader, and beat him in front of the proconsul. Now, that's the way religion works. Do you recognize that? Religion works that way. When religion doesn't get its way, religion gets angry. Have you ever noticed that? I mean, religious people are some of the most angry, vindictive, vengeful, revengeful people in the world today. Do you understand that religion and religious anger, religious rage, is what caused some radical Islamists to bomb the World Trade Centers on 9-11? Do you understand that it is the religious rage that burns in the hearts of religious people that causes them to cut off the heads of Egyptian Coptic Christians when they can't silence their message? Do you understand how damaging and damning religion is? We don't need religion. We just need to be followers of Jesus. 
and when you simply build a relationship with God through faith in the Lord Jesus Christ and are committed to following Him, it doesn't produce rage in the heart. It produces love and compassion for even your enemies. Isn't that what Jesus taught in the Sermon on the Mount? Love those who persecute you and say all manner of evil against you falsely for my sake. Love them. Bless them. Don't curse them. Do good to them. And then what did he say? Then you'll be known as the children of your Father, which is in heaven. And so you see, religion is a very bad thing. Following Jesus Christ is an eternally good thing. But they, they vented their anger and they, and they beat their own synagogue leader right there in the courtroom, right there in front of the governor. That's religion at its finest, isn't it? If you don't get your way, then beat your leader. I'm glad you're not religious, by the way. <laughs> True to his sharp legal mindset, Gallio viewed this beating of the synagogue leader as an issue that did not fall within the jurisdiction of his Roman court. He just viewed this as another religious squabble among the Jews, and he would not drag that into the Roman court. He, he, he viewed it as something that needed to be settled by the Jews, and so he took no action to intervene. Luke wrote about it in Acts chapter 18, the last part of verse number 17. Gallio showed no concern, whatever. It wasn't that he was hard-hearted. It that was he was a lawyer. And he looked at it from a purely legal standpoint. And as far as he was concerned, that was not his concern because his court didn't have jurisdiction over that. And so the Jews beat their leader out of religious rage. And then here's the, here's the conclusion. Here's, here's the bottom line of where we need to get to. The bottom line is this. As long as God's people are on mission for Him, they are under His protective custody. He encourages when they need encouragement and He protects when they need protection. They are invincible until the mission is completed. And we can see that over and over again in the book of Acts. The Apostle Paul is on mission for God. God is present with him and God protects him in Corinth. And then uh, Paul is arrested and, and, and later on and he's, he's arrested uh, by the, the Jews in the city of Jerusalem and they're trying to tear him in peace and pieces. God's precise timing. God sends the Roman soldiers to rescue him and get him away from them. And then when there's an attack against his life later on, God sends Paul's nephew to find out about it, passes the word along. The Romans rescue Paul from Jerusalem, send him to Caesarea. Once he gets to Caesarea, then he's, he is determined, God is determined that he's going to go preach the gospel in Rome. En route to Rome, they get in the midst of a storm out into the Aegean Sea, and the storm rages for like 21 days. The sailors give up all hope of being saved. They think they're all going to perish. Seasoned sailors who know the sea don't think there's any hope of them surviving this storm, but an angel appears to God and says, don't be afraid, I've got you back. No one with you is going to perish. They survive the storm. They undergo a shipwreck, but they survive the storm, just like God says. They get to shore on the island of Malta, and, and, and Paul is being servant-hearted. He's helping build a fire because they're all wet from the rain of the storm, and it's cold on that island, and they're building a fire, and Paul has a, a, a bundle of firewood in his arm, and he's, and he's about to throw it on the fire, and a poisonous snake bites him and fastens itself to his hand. And the islanders look at him, and they know this is a deadly poisonous snake, and they look at Paul, and they watch him expecting his hand to swell up and, and him to, to, to die and go into convulsions and, and, and writhe on the ground and die right there before them but God has said as long as you're on mission for me I'm going to protect you because I want you at Rome to preach the gospel there and write two-thirds of the New Testament there and so I'm with you and nothing happened when the snake bit him so you see evil men disruptive weather conditions even poisonous snakes cannot harm the man of God or the woman of God who is on mission for him until the mission is completed. And then God will take you to heaven. When the mission is over, then you're going to die, and you're going to go to heaven. And you say, well, we're going to die. Everybody's going to die. Get a grip. The Scripture says that. 
It's appointed unto men once to die, and after that, the judgment. Sometimes we as Christians, I think we shame God because we act like death is such a tragedy. Death is not a tragedy for a Christian. The apostle said that it's far better. He said, for me to live as Christ and to die is gain. That word gain in Greek means a promotion. It means when you die, you get your promotion. When you die, you finally get what you've been living for, which is the opportunity to be in the presence of Jesus in heaven forever and ever and ever. So get over it. We're all going to die, okay? We're all going to die. And we need to be sure that when we die, we know we're going to go to heaven. In the meantime, we need to claim God's promise. Do not be afraid. I'm with you. No one is going to attack and harm you. Just claim his protection. Claim his presence. Now here's, I want to say this as we close this moment uh, of the service. I want to say this. I just said, everybody's going to die. So get a grip and get over it. I just said that, and then I said, just be sure that you know you're going to go to heaven. That's, that's, that's the deal. It's a real tragedy if you die and you don't know you're going to go to heaven. It's not a tragedy when you die if you know you're going to go to heaven. I speak from experience. I have preached hundreds of funerals over the last 40 years, and I speak from experience. It is tragic when I have to stand up before a group of people and try to comfort them, and we don't know if the deceased went to heaven or not because he didn't leave a clear testimony that he really knew Jesus. There's no evidence of that. That's hard. But I tell you, it's not hard to preach a funeral. When the person had a clear testimony that they had received the gift of eternal life that Jesus offers, and they live that out in their daily life, that's not hard then. Then it's a celebration. Then a funeral can turn into a party. And that's what I want. Listen, if I'm your pastor and I die... You better throw a party. You need to get that. I want the praise band. I want the lights. I want the whole deal. I want a send-off, and you, you do it, okay? And don't come here and weep and wail and mourn. Come here and have a party. Have a potluck. Do something to celebrate. You understand that? Now, here's, I want to tell you this now. There's only one way that you can celebrate and that others can celebrate your passing when that time comes. And that's if you have left a clear testimony that you really know Jesus. And the only way to do that, the only way to know that you're going to go to heaven when you die is number one, you've got to admit that you've sinned. Scripture says that, Romans 3.23, all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And then you've got to understand that there are consequences to sin. Sin kills everything it touches. Sin separates you from God and cuts off God's eternal life. So not only will sin ultimately kill you physically, it, will, it immediately separates you from God, so you're dead spiritually right where you are if you've never done anything about that. Alive on the outside, but very dead on the inside. And if you don't do anything about it, it will ultimately kill you eternally. You'll be eternally separated from God. The scripture says that in Romans 6.23, the wages of sin. What you earn because of what you've done is wages. What you've done is sin. What you earn is death. The wages of sin is death. But the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. So you see, you got a choice. You could admit you've sinned and understand the consequences and just do nothing about it and take the penalty of death physically, spiritually, and eternally. Or, you can receive the gift of God, which he says is eternal life, and he says it's only available in Christ Jesus our Lord. You can turn to Jesus and believe what God says about him and understand that he's your only hope of heaven, that he's the only cure for your sin problem. You can call on him to receive the gift that he died to purchase for you, and you can receive eternal life. So that when you die physically, you'll live on eternally in heaven with him. And the scripture says that. It says, it says that God demonstrated his love toward us and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. You see, he paid the price of death so we could have the gift of life. He died so we can live forever. But you have to believe that. John 3.16 says that God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son so that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. You got to believe the story about Jesus. You got to believe that he was God's only son, that God sent him into the world, that he lived here for about 33 and a half years, that he never sinned. He worked a few miracles along the way to prove that he really was God. And then at the end of his life, he voluntarily allowed 
him to a Roman rack of execution called a cross. And when he died on the cross, he took the punishment for every sin we have ever committed. And because he took the punishment, we don't have to. Because he died, we don't have to. Because he paid the price of death, we can have the gift of life. And if we believe that, he says we can have everlasting life. But we must believe it strongly enough that we're willing to call on Jesus to receive it. That's what Romans 10, 13 says. It says that everyone, I'm so glad that verse starts with that word, aren't you? Nobody's left out. Everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. It doesn't say they might be saved. It says they will be saved. So you see, if you understand you've sinned, and you understand the consequences of sin, and they're great, and you believe that Jesus is the answer for that, and you believe it strongly enough that you're willing to call on Him to receive the gift of eternal life that His story is all about, then you can receive it by calling on Him. And He said He would give it to you. And He's never failed yet. He has a perfect track record. He's always done everything He ever said He would do, and He'll do it for you. Why did I say all that? Because you're going to die eventually. And the only way to get over the fear of that is to know where you're going when you pass through the doors of death. And you need to know that you're going to go to heaven. People say, they look at me funny when I say that. They say, you can't know that till you die. I say, that's way too risky. <laughs> way too risky. And the only other thing wrong with that is it's not what the Bible says. 1 John 5.13 says... These things I write to you who believe in the name of the Son of God so that you may know that you have eternal life. So you can know you've got it. How do you know you've got it? You know what God says to do to get it, and you know you've done it. Then you know you've got it because God always keeps his end of the deal. He's faithful, always does what he says he'll do. You know how I know I'm going to heaven? Because God says so. Because I know I've done what God said to do to get eternal life. It's not because I'm good. Those of you who spend much time with me know that I'm not good. It's not because I'm good. That's not why I'm going to heaven. And it's not because I'm a preacher. Because that's not why I'm going to heaven. And, and it's, 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 it's not any of that. It's because God loved me enough to send Jesus to die for me. And I believe that. And I've received eternal life. That's the only reason I'm going to heaven. Not because I'm good, but because he's good. That's the only reason. You need to get that. And you know, we need to be sharing that with people. You would be amazed at the people who don't go to church, don't want to have anything to do with Jesus, because they think, and, and, and we church people have created this mess, because we have somehow convinced them that they got to be good enough. Don't you hear people say that all the time? You know, I, when I get my life straightened out, then I'll go to church. What are they saying in essence? I'm not good enough right now. Bless your heart, none of us are good enough. None of us. We need to tell them, if you're looking for a place, a church to come to, where there aren't any good people, then come here. You'll fit right in. We need to be telling them that. I'm serious. Because that's what the Bible says, isn't it? There is none that doeth good. No, not one. You know, one time, I don't remember who did it, but somebody put a sign out front out there on the marquee that said something like this. It said, if you're looking for the perfect church, this is not it. I love that. Because it's true. And when we put on airs and act like we're good, and that's why we go to church, and that's why we think we're blessed of God and going to get to go to heaven because we're good, then we alienate most of the world. And they're going to hell all around us. We need to just tell them the truth. We're not good, and they're not good, and the good news is Jesus loves the not good. Do you get that? God so loved the world. We've got to remember that. 